Hello, welcome to the Do Lectures podcast with me, Gav Thompson. Today on Dot Dot Dot, we talk to Anna Jones, who did a Do Lecture back in 2015. Anna is an award-winning cook, chef and food writer. She's just released her fourth book, One Pot, Pan, Planet, to huge critical acclaim. She has a column in The Guardian where she writes about food. She started off life working for Jamie Oliver as one of his protégés at 15 and since then has worked for him for seven years before focusing on her own books with a huge emphasis on vegetarianism, vegetables and how frankly eating more vegetables is A, delicious and B, can help save the planet. She's a fantastic guest. I love our chat. So please sit back, relax, grab a carrot, put your feet up and listen to Anna Jones dot dot dot. Welcome to Dot Dot Dot, Anna Jones. Hello, nice to be here with you, Gav. So Anna, look, welcome to Dot Dot Dot. What we want to do here is pick up on your Do Lectures talk from 2015 and, you know, talk about the Dot 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 since and what's happened since 2015, of which I know a lot has, so we've got a lot to talk about. But we, there'll be lots of listeners who won't have seen your Do Lecture or maybe not remember it. I would urge you, anyone to rectify that. So why don't you... Take us to 2015. Give us your backstory, which is in itself a fab story. Tell us about Anna Jones. What I would sort of describe myself as now is a cook, a writer, I guess an author in some ways. That's what I spend a lot of my time doing. I focus on vegetable-led food, you know, vegetarian food, putting vegetables at the centre of my plate, my life, I guess. (laughs) I think it's been that shift in my life, that shift to vegetarianism that has kind of inspired all the work I've been doing since, well, up to 2015 and and the lecture and and since then. How did you get into... Because your first start start of your life, it wasn't necessarily obvious that you were going to become a cook, a food author, uh, uh, the queen of greens. <laughs> Tell us what how life started for you. So, yeah, absolutely. I think I sort of went to a school that was sort of reasonably academically focused, which was great. It was a brilliant school. And creativity was sort of just completely pushed aside, I think. So that kind of creative part of my brain, which actually I think is sort of in some senses, the most powerful part of my brain was just completely ignored. So I studied economics, I went into, you know, first of all, banking, then into sort of financial PR, and those kind of things. And just sort of, you know, had a big moment of like, what am I doing? Where am I? I? Why have I done this? (laughs) Like, none of this suits me, you know, none of this kind of lights me up. And I think there's two sides to me, I can be very, very hardworking. But if I'm not engaged in something, I am excellent at being lazy. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, you said that in your lecture, didn't you? You're just phenomenally good at being lazy, which which I have to say I empathise with myself. Uh, <laughs> so what age were you when you had this epiphany about you needed to make a pivot? Yeah, so I was 24. I was working, as I said, in sort of in financial PR and it all just felt very weird. And I was on the way to my job one morning and I sort of picked up this this article in the Times Educational Supplement. Someone had just actually left it on the train next to me and I read it and it was all about determining your calling by and your passion by which part of the sort of Sunday supplement you turn to first. And that was kind of a light bulb moment for me, really, because cooking was something I had always done. It was, you know, I'd run little catering businesses out of my mum and dad's kitchen when I was younger. It was what I was doing while, you know, my brothers and sisters were playing outside on the climbing frame. It was the thing that I just got really, really, really excited about. And so, yeah, it was really, really, really strange that this paper was next to me at the exact moment that I needed it. And so I really do think sort of my route to cooking was, it felt like it came from somewhere else anyway. So I read this article, the part the Sunday supplement I turned to was always the food it was always the recipes from there I literally went into work Google cookery courses in London this one with Jamie Oliver popped up I was like that's weird but I'll apply and two (laughs) days later I was kind of at the selection weekend and I think a week later I'd quit my job and I was cooking in his kitchen for 15 this was the early days of the 15 sort of exactly so this was the early days of 15 wow that's so fortuitous that timing the view have you seen that piece of paper on the tube, you applying that day, let's be honest, getting on 15 in those days, we'll talk about it in a minute, was amazing. And Jamie's been a big part of your career, I know. That's amazing, right? I mean, what are the chances? 
it definitely felt like a higher force was at play. I'm not yeah. I'm not in any way a religious person, but there are moments in life where you're like, what? This is all happening too, too easily yeah, and too quickly. And, and, yeah. and it's working. It did feel like luck and whatever else you call that force was on my side. Let's just remind people who may have forgotten what 15 was. Brilliant, mm. brilliant, brilliant, brilliant idea. And fabulously executed, actually. I, I went to the restaurant many times. Tell the listeners, just remind everyone what 15 was. Yeah, so 15 was a social enterprise project set up by Jamie Oliver in which he took 15 young, usually unemployed people from various different backgrounds and put them through this sort of brilliant course in how to learn how to be a chef, but also how to learn about food, how to develop a work ethic. It was kind of like a full 360. And, you know, the course had lots of different people on it. When I went into the interview, I really thought I wasn't going to be the kind of person they were looking for I thought they were looking for people who were from much more challenged backgrounds than I was you know you know lucky enough to have had brilliant parents and a decent education so I just thought I went as a punt really but no there were there were different people so the whole spectrum from people who just come from robbing cars as their job to you know me who'd come out of a sort of fairly sort of staid financial <laughs> our job so it was amazing actually and and so over a year we got taught all the different sections of the kitchen we also got taken on amazing trips to see producers and really appreciate that connection with you know the land where the food comes from and you know we just got taught really a lot about working hard and a lot about kind of you know grit and determination and how much you have to put in to get where you want to be there were 15 of you right yeah, I think there were actually a few more the year I was there. I think there were sort what of 18 year were you? or 20. Do you remember how far? I was the second year, so they'd just done the TV show. Um, right. It was, you know, there was quite a lot of hype around it. And they did a little sort of catch-up TV show with me on and, and all the people in my year. But luckily it wasn't quite the same sort of cameras yeah, in your face as the first year. And then you ended up working for Jamie, right? So I ended up working for Jamie after a couple of years of kind of working in his going abroad and working. I worked in Italy and in, in Dea in Mallorca at different restaurants. And then I kind of came back to the sort of 15 family, which I very much feel like it is even to this day, even though 15 sadly doesn't exist anymore. It feels like a very special and supportive network of people. Um, so I went back to 15 to the restaurant and I was working there as a chef. I think someone came up to me and said, oh, do you, you know, we want some of the chefs to write some recipes for a magazine. And I think secret in my head, I'd always known that that was my route, that I wanted to kind of write and cook and use that sort of creativity in that way. So I jumped on that. And then from there, I think Jamie and his team saw that I could do that. And I went on to work for him, sort of helping him in all the different um, facets of his business for the next seven years. Wow. So he's been a big part of your career. He's been an enormous part of my career, I think. You know, still is to this day. I have no idea how he manages to juggle the amount of things that he does. But he still checks in on all the people from 15, not just me. But, you know, I, I bump into other 15 graduates. And, you know, he'll text us all every few weeks just to check in, see how we are. I just don't, don't know, know how he's got the space in his head. But, no, he's been a pivotal part of my career. He obviously taught me so much about food, about problems provenance about cooking and I think the brilliant thing about Jamie is that he taught me both ends of the spectrum he thought taught me about how important it was to go to farmers markets to buy produce made by brilliant producers and artisans but then at the same time he taught me how important it is that recipes are accessible that ingredients are available in the places that people actually shop in supermarkets that recipes don't have 25 ingredients and that you know people don't want to cook for two and a half hours every night yeah. so I think he's got a real you know he's really got two sides Tim Jamie he, he appreciates the need to kind of support farmers and sustainability but he also is a very his work is so approachable, and I think that's something I've really kind of taken on as well. Yeah, and we'll come back to that in a minute, actually, because I totally agree with you. I I think Jamie is amazing. I don't know him at all, but I, I you know, I'm as a consumer, what he's done, if you go back to The Naked Chef, was he, you know, he just made putting the effort into cooking a kind of fun and enjoyable and approachable thing to do. That's the first thing. He's definitely democratised decent food for people mm. like us and, and the whole James Italian I thought was an amazing chain of restaurants and then the third thing which I you know absolutely doff my cap to him is the campaigning the, the school meals thing 
which rolls on and, and taking on the US. And we'll come back to that because I know you were part of that. But I mean, that's, that's and again, you know, to be able to do all those three is amazing. And, and you know, thank goodness for Jamie Oliver. So you mentioned there that you decided that your particular outlet for your skills, talent, passion was going to be books and, and writing. How did you kind of get to that? Because that's not, in itself, that's quite a leap. Of all the things you could have done, you could have gone into chefing, you could have had your own restaurant, you could have, frankly, done a Jamie and tried to get into TV. You could do any number mm. of things. And, you know, there are a lot of cookbooks out there. That, you know, a lot of them are on my shelf, unopened. <laughs> how, how did you make that leap to go, it's going to be about writing and, and books? So I think with the writing and books, when I think it actually went quite a long way back, I do remember being little and sort of writing down all my recipes and having a little notebook and doing sort of cookery demos to the pot plants. So it was definitely something that was there from quite early on. But I think I always knew that I had this, I love cooking, I love the creativity of cooking, but I'm also quite a visual person and I also love I love words, I love writing, I love the challenge of trying to, you know, succinctly describe a process or, you know, a thing. So I think when I started working for Jamie and I started sort of helping him write and develop recipes and then was going to the shoots and helping create the kind of image that's drawing people into the recipe that's, you know, saying, cook me, cook me and getting people excited about what they're going to cook and eat. I think, you know, that's when I knew that that was, I think, the route for me. I love the medium of books. I know that these days, you know, we've got so many other things competing for that time and that space. But um, what I love about a book is, or even a magazine, is the fact that once it's done, it's done. It exists as a kind mm. of living, breathing thing. You can't change the mistakes, which obviously is quite stressful mm. when you're putting it together. But it is, it's a collection and a moment there's something that I really, really love and kind of appreciate about that, about something that exists and once it's there, it's there. I feel like our, you know, the way we operate with sort of social media and everything else these days, you know, things can be changed and, and modified and rectified. But I love the kind of, I love that about a book. The thing, and this is a genuine sort of question, which is, was there anyone at the beginning, so your first book, A Modern Way to Eat, right? Um, yeah. Followed by One Way to Cook, followed by Modern Cooks Year, followed by your work of genius, which is one, which we'll come back to, because <laughs> uh, it really is genius. But was there somebody that, at the beginning going, come on, Anna, does the world need another cookbook? It feels like there are a lot of cookbooks out there, and there's a lot of chefs who probably were on telly, and I'm thinking of Jamie Frankly and, and Nigella and Nigel Slater, or whatever. There, there's there's enough chefs with enough telly profile and or famous restaurants with the names above the door. Was there not people going, it's quite a big ask, isn't it? Yeah, there definitely were people probably asking that question. And I was asking myself that question a lot as well. And I do actually with every book I Right. The very first book I wrote was not under my own name. It was for Innocent Drinks back when, you know, oh, they were a very different yes. company. So I wrote a book called Hungry for them. And it was all about kind of family food, but getting your five a day into kind of your spag bowl or your or your salad or whatever, or your shepherd's pie or whatever else. So what happened in terms of, you know, getting to the point of being offered a book happened quite naturally because I wrote this book for Innocent. The publishers were really impressed again, was one of those very kind of um, moments where everything sort of seemed to sort of click into place. But no, I'm with you. I think there are so many, so many books out there. And I really don't have a desire to just add another one to the pile. But when I started writing my first book, I'd been vegetarian for about three or four years. The kind of food that I was eating and making at home just didn't really seem to exist, both in restaurants, but also in books. And I just felt great cooking it. I felt creative making it. I felt really good in my body eating that way. And so I think that was the impetus for my books. It was trying to bring this kind of, you know, modern, in inverted commas, vegetarian food to people, like trying to communicate the food that I was eating and making in my home. And so at the, at the time it did, and I, I still think it's, you know, it does, you know, feel like a book that... I wanted it to, in some ways to fly under the radar because I didn't right. want to shout vegetarian on the front cover. Yeah. I wanted people to get three quarters of the way through the book and be like, oh, this is all del delicious, 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 delicious. And then be like, oh, there's no meat or fish. So yeah, I get that. I get that. I really do get that. You must have smart asses like me 
saying to you all the time, surely you should have a TV show. I'm definitely, that, that question must come up often. Why have you resisted that? Well, I think it's been a combination of, I think I probably could have got myself on TV if I'd wanted to, but I don't want to sound like an idiot, but I think there's an integrity to what I do that I find it very difficult to compromise on. I feel very strongly about the sort of the visual aspect of all of my work, about the words, about the kind of energy that goes into it, about the people who help me, about the kind of the way in which it's received. And, um, you know, I've never really felt like I've there's been a sort of good match for me in terms of that with something visual or, or on TV. So, um, yeah, I think the books feels like a good space. And also, I was actually having an interesting conversation this morning with um, wonderful Jess, who works with me, about kind of growth and about, you know, how we all strived for more and more and more in our businesses and how we all strive to kind of, whether it's a product or a TV show or this or that or the other. And Actually, I really feel in a place now where obviously I'm bringing new work, but also about kind of this maintaining, maintaining this thing that I've got, this thing that I've built, this thing that I'm proud of and this food that I absolutely stand for. And luckily, a lot of people connect with. And it's taken me a long time to get to this place of, of being happy with the kind of just enjoying what is rather than, you know, pushing for more and more and more. And I don't know whether I'm I'm going to be in this kind of happy place for a long time because I do long I've got I've got yeah I've got an ambitious uh, you know I have definitely got a very ambitious spirit and that fire in my belly I love that answer Anna it's a very do lectures philosophy you know, grow slowly do one thing mm. well you're doing one thing very 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 well <laughs> which is you're writing some fucking amazing cookery books uh, <laughs> and you're doing it slowly and you have authenticity and I love it. Annoying people like me will always be going, ah, do a TV show, do it, do some webcasting, build, build it. And actually, you'd like, no, bollocks to that. I'm doing what I do well, and I'm really satisfied, and I'm being really authentic, and shut up, Gav. So let's talk about the V word, <laughs> vegetarianism. You came to it a little bit late. When did you become veggie? Um, about 12 years ago. So Okay. Yeah. And as you just mentioned, and as I would totally agree with, it's still probably less so now, and we'll we'll talk about that in a second, but it still has a little bit of baggage attached to it, vegetarian, vegetarianism. And again, as you you manage to swerve all of that, you know, your second book doesn't mention vegetarian on the cover, was the first and third two. Just give us the sell on vegetarianism or being a veggie or whatever you want to call it. Explain why that is the way forward. Yeah, well, I think, uh, first of all, I think vegetarianism in some ways can be, you know, a bit of a divisive word. It's not, it's something I actively chose not to use in my, in some of my books and, and often not in press and interviews and stuff, because I feel like it immediately conjures up images for some people of kind of like ungenerous food, brightly painted cafes, people in hemp trousers, all of which I'm yeah. fully behind. Um, but <laughs> but it just is a barrier, I think, for some people who actually would love and enjoy eating food that is made of vegetables. But there's preconceptions there that stop them from kind of, you know, stepping over the precipice, shall we say? Sure, sure. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. I've come to it very late, like very recently. And the reason I resisted it for many years was I thought it was, it didn't equal joyful. There certainly mm. felt like there's some sort of sacrifice and some sort of piety. And, and so, yeah, I fully agree with the brand baggage of vegetarian or vegetarianism. Mm. It, it We're just... about, I would say, I'm a vegetarian. I would say in our house, we're sort of, edging towards 85, 90% vegan. We're not totally there yet. But I think for a lot of people, they don't want to put a label on how they eat. And for a lot of people, you know, being completely vegetarian, being completely vegan is, is really scary. So actually, you know, I think we just need to encourage every shift um, yeah. and encourage, you know, every meal that is eaten without meat, not put guilt around, you know, if people still are enjoying meat or fish. We can only make decisions for ourselves, for our own bodies, for our own families, you know, for our own kind of 
you know, socioeconomic situation. So, yeah. you know, to sort of stand here and say to everyone, you know, put a vegetarian label or a vegan label on everything, I just don't think is actually helpful to the end game, which is getting more and more people to eat as many plants, as many vegetables as possible, you know, in their day, week, month, year life. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I love what you've done because you've swerved the problem. There, there is some brown baggage with the word vegetarian or vegetarianisms or vegetarians. And you've just gone, actually, the end objective is for many reasons, which we're about to talk about in one, what about your book one, there are many, 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 many very good reasons to eat vegetables much more often than you eat meat. And you're taking people on the best journey, in my opinion, which is you, you're proving it by the quality of the food, by the quality of the experience by the joyfulness of eating the fantastic veg based food and in doing so all the other good things will happen but they're not necessarily the reason to be doing it if you see what I mean you've done a lovely piece of brand strategy actually uh, <laughs> on, on, the, on the brand of vegetarianism so your book one pot pan planet is genuinely in my opinion a work of genius not just because of the content but because of the timing it's amazing some of the reviews I've been reading are literally off the scale. I think it's the most, it's certainly the best reviewed cooking book I've ever seen on Amazon. It's, it's literally off the scale. Seriously, guys, I'm doing a deliberate plug here by Anna Jones's book <laughs> one. Tell me That's how sweet. it came about and how you, the timing of it is just so brilliant. Tell us the story of one. So the story of one, I guess, part of that conversation we were having earlier about really wanting each piece of work I bring to the world to the table I guess to be adding something it took me quite a long time to get because I, I feel really proud of the other three books I've written and they all had their own premise and and they they handled different things so you know I was sitting for a long time with the idea of possibly writing another book I think you know the conversations I have now the social media and you know people emailing and my newsletter I guess um, I have more of a conversation with the people who cook my recipes and I think what I understood from their comments was that they wanted to know what else they could do you know they'd hit that point of like eating joyful delicious vegetarian food but they wanted to know lots of questions about kind of provenance about where do I buy this food about what you know is this better than this or, you know are imported bananas better than local tomatoes you know and so I wanted to for the people who have been with me through the other books to be able to kind of like take them on a few steps and to be able to weave information about kind of how we can be sustainable in our kitchens how we can make sustainable decisions into a recipe book because I feel like everyone I know wants to be doing better they want to be doing something they want to be taking positive repeatable actions but you know people do not have time to read you know the lengthy Guardian articles the environmental science books and also all of those opinions are so counter to each other quite often that it's very difficult to distill actually what is sort of practical, easy, manageable. Yeah. So I wanted to weave that information into a cookbook because I feel like cookbook for me, the place that I go before I write my shopping list, before I decide, you know, what I'm going to buy, what I am going to cook. And so it felt to me very friendly to be able to flick through some recipes and be reminded about food miles or be reminded about, you know, biodiversity. And so that's where sort of the idea for one came from. I also wanted it to be, you know, so for people who are perhaps new to vegetarian or veg-based food, I wanted it to be quick and easy cooking, quick and easy cooking that is unreasonably delicious for the amount of time that you spend making it. What I want, you know, if people are making their first, second, third, tenth, twentieth vegetarian meal, I want it to be friendly. I want it to be quick. I want it to be easy. I want them to want to do it again. And so I think for a long time as a chef, you can sort of lament over these, you know, crazy flavour combinations of kind of, I don't know, yuzu or these imported Japanese seaweeds or whatever. And that's really sort of, to me, that feels like glory cooking. It feels slightly like ego cooking. And, you know, I do that now and again. But actually, the shift for people, the change for people is getting those Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday dinners right. And, you know, getting kind of friendly recipes that they can cook on those nights filled with vegetables. And so that really, you know, is the aim of one to be able to take people on a few steps forward in their sort of sustainability journey at home but also to be able to you know give them solutions for the the food that they want to eat really and that 
is why it's such a work of genius. <laughs> Listeners, if you haven't listened to Tessa from Olio, please listen to that She's podcast amazing. from a few weeks ago. She's amazing. And what that her podcast highlights is quite how impactful food and food choices and agriculture is in a negative way on the climate. I mean, that hardly comes as a newsflash to anyone, but some of the stats out there are unbelievable. The great thing about your book is it's just, it's one of those things I love, my listeners know I love this, the kind of win, 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 right? At its heart, it's an amazing cookbook about joyful, lovely community, eat, cooking and eating, filled with amazing veggie recipes. And as we know, if we could do one thing, let's all stop eating meat, frankly, or fish and just go veggie, because that would, as Tessa said, told us the other day, that would probably help a large part of our problems. But it also helps educate people on veg-based food and on packaging and on the planet and on, you know, reducing waste. And it's, it's the whole thing. It's, that's why it's work of genius. Oh, Gav, Judge. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just love the timing of it as well. Tell us about how did you sort of time it so that you, you know, because not least on the back of lockdown, people have kind of missed good cooking. Yeah, and missed having nice, lovely meals with their friends. And I just find the timing of it just perfect. How did you get it so right on the timing? Well, I think it was partly a bit of luck, as it always is. Also a bit of good advice from, you know, my publisher and my agent who have been been in the game longer than I have. And actually, I love them so much because they're not, you know, there's no desperation to what they do. There's no like, we've got to get out now. We've got to hit this wave. You know, it's more they trust and they know and that there's a trust that the time will be right. And I think that was part of this. I think that this year has proven to us that as human beings, we are capable of kind of radical behavioural change, which I think wasn't something that anyone would have believed before. I think that was always the conversation around shifting how we eat. People like, well, well people just aren't going to do it. People yeah. will not change their habits. People cannot change the way they lo- live. And obviously this year has been exceptional, but it has proven that we can change our habits, that we want to change our habits. I think also this year has kind of galvanised everyone's desire to kind of come out the other side of this year, doing more, giving back, you know, having a positive impact. So I think the timing of it was, of it coming out, it came out in March, just as sort of lockdown was lifting. You know, I think people really want to they want to know what they can do. They want to do everything they can. I think people, obviously, there's you know enormous responsibility on big industry and government, and you know that's not something I'm an expert on. But I think people want to be making as many individual changes and as much individual impact as possible. And I think the book came out at a time where people were really keen and ready for new recipes because they were so freaking yeah, bored so of bored. all the things they've been cooking. Yeah, I'd added up how many recipes I cooked just as we came out of lockdown. I'd been cooking breakfast, lunch and dinner and I was at nearly 2,000. And, you wow. know, that's the same for every household. Yeah, 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 that's crazy, So people just wanted some fresh new some, stuff some new. to cook. But also I think people just, it really hit a time where people were feeling that they wanted, you know, all of their actions to be something positive. It's brilliant. So, yeah, look, one of the criticisms that could be levelled at, I guess, at you and I, not you directly, but this sort of ethos is that it works really well if you live in Hackney and you can go to farmers markets and you've got the time and resource and energy and to get really into produce. One of the things Jamie did really well was tackle you know, mass market food issues around school dinners and, and you know got a massive kind of campaign going. How do you address that that sort of niggle which is for people who you know are currently their life to accommodate this level of choice and, and expense possibly on the fantastic project. How, how do you how do you deal with that potential criticism? Well, I think about that a lot and I think about that a lot when I write my books. I think, you know, when it comes to the ingredients, I have been quite careful to try and use ingredients which are available in supermarkets because whilst we might all love the idea of everyone shopping in a farmer's market, it's actually not achievable, it's not doable and it's not what currently happens. And I really do believe that being an active, informed shopper in a supermarket, you know, can be as impactful to the system as being, you know, a shopper in a farmer's market or a biodynamic 
vegetable store because if you are shopping in an active and informed way within the supermarkets and sending a message through the supermarket systems that you're buying the local stuff that they're putting in there. You're buying the loose veg that doesn't have packaging. You're buying the stuff that is, you know, made in the UK and not imported. You're buying those different types of vegetables that they've decided to put on that help with biodiversity. Then I think we can all, you know, think that supermarket shopping is a bad thing it's not a bad thing it's just we've got to buy the right things in those supermarkets obviously there's always going to be a financial barrier generally I think vegetarian food is pretty much always going to be cheaper than buying meat or fish so you're sort of on to a win there but I also think a lot of the sort of sustainability shifts that people can make are luckily the buying an electric car they're not flying you know those actually do count a lot of people out in terms of budget it's just too expensive or too complicated but a lot of the sustainability decisions that are part of this book and are part of what everyone should be doing like you know reducing the energy in your kitchen so a third of our energy is used in the kitchens a lot you know that's not just cooking it's washing up it's storing our food it's all of those things so actually making some easy shifts um like cooking in one pan and not turning your oven your grill your kettle your food processor and everything on means that you are reducing the amount of money you're spending on energy and that is going to help the planet but it's also going to help everyone's budget so I think whilst there are bits of this conversation that perhaps do feel elitist there are more bits of this conversation which are applicable and actually are even more important if you know you are budgeting you know or on a strict budget yeah I mean I think you're right and I love the way your approach looks at it holistically I think it's worth just flagging that issue because it does get dragged into the debate sometimes as does another one, which I'm just going to hit you with, which is sort of local farmers, British farmers going, look, if you ate a piece of meat from my livestock, I can sell it up the road. The sustainability argument, the impact that piece of meat is having on the world is probably less impactful than you, Mr. Ponce Ponce Pants, you know, sh- shipping an avocado <laughs> from South America to the UK air freight. That kind of old school, you know, eat local produce from the end of the road, including mm. meat versus avocados, which let's be honest, I love an avocado, but God, are they bad for the environment. Yeah, they, they really are bad for the environment. And I think you can get some from Italy, but the amount of people who have access to Italian avocados, you know, we could probably get all of them into my yeah. house to be yeah, honest yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I haven't got a very big house <laughs> so yeah that's a really interesting part of the conversation I think and not something that I have all the answers to but what I do think is that there's enough people out there eating meat we don't need to convince people to eat meat there's a lot of meat being eaten and even if 50% of the population became vegan or vegetarian overnight, there would still be a lot of meat being eaten. I think there needs to be a lot of education around for people who do still choose to eat meat about making sure that that meat is from farmers that are local, that it was responsibly farmed and raised and killed. It's not something I will ever do, but you know, I understand that that is a choice that some people make. And it's about the education and the investment and understanding why they're spending that extra bit of money. But for me, I just feel like it's not eating meat that, you know, those local farmers aren't going to go out of business very quickly. There's still people here eating meat, eating fish. There's not enough people eating vegetables and and putting that at the centre of their diet. So I feel like That's just what I've got to shout about. But there are some really nuanced conversations, especially when you get into kind of the soil health, into biodynamic farming and into the role of animals um, in that sense, in in farming, in tilling the land and in that kind of 360 degree holistic farming process. And I know there's some really interesting research being done into possible vegan alternatives to, you know, the bones that are used in biodynamic farming and tilling the land in other ways in the kind of no-dig farming. So it's definitely an ongoing conversation, I think, and, and not something I have all the answers for. But all I know is that people need to be eating more veg. And so that's what and, I'm going and, to keep talking about. <laughs> and, and lovely, joyful veg. Just help me on one little argument, because you're a... You're a 
accomplished chef and I'm not. I've just noticed the rise over the lockdown of things like HelloFresh and Gusto. I mean, they've literally gone bonkers. And I'm a massive fan of Gusto. I think they make my life very easy. But my mate, who is as close to a sort of professional chef as I know, he's a very accomplished, so he's not professional, thinks they're sort of, you know, the devil's work. I mean, I'm exaggerating to make the point <laughs> because they're kind of dumbing it all down. Just help me on my... How do you feel about those kind of ready-made box menu things? I think there are issues with them, definitely issues with the packaging. I think some of those the brands do really well and do compostable packaging and or collect their packaging, but some of the brands are not doing great and you're throwing an enormous amount of plastic in the bin. So I think that's always going to be um, something that could be improved and something we need to talk about. But I think the real shift in people's health, people's kind of commitment to sustainability in the way our food affects the planet is really just getting people cooking. I think if people connect with food, they connect with ingredients, they cook in the kitchen, they get that satisfaction of making something themselves, that creative spark that happens when you cook. I think that's the battle. That's the thing that we need to get people doing. And if measured out portions of spices arriving in a box at your front door is the only way you're going to cook, then go for it. I, I feel like, and also I feel like it's a first step. I think all of these shifts that we have to make around food, that we will have to make around sustainability, it can't be zero to a hundred in one step. It's like trying to change people's palates. You can't go from a doner kebab to an asparagus risotto. It doesn't happen. So I think all of these things need to be done step by step. And perhaps some of these meal kits, they are the step, you know. Yeah. If they're empowering people to cook and be confident cooking, then, you know, maybe in a year's time, they won't need them anymore. I, to I totally agree. I mean, I, I, I defend them quite violently in that, you know, as a case <laughs> study of one, they've got me into cooking. I'm now confident in the kitchen. I now know how to cook. And I was taught through Gusto, thanks very much. And I, I sort of, you know, I have a lot of cookery books that are unopened. I'm going to be just using yours from now on. But you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I've got the confidence to now cook. My kids, you know, the thing about those meal kits, they're great for kids. My kids all now cook. And I think, you know, people are snotty about them, but I think that's that's in itself part of the problem, is that food snobbery, this is not what we're about. We're about trying to help the masses, because it has to be the masses if we're going to save the planet, adopt tasty veg-based cooking. And if they get into it through recipe boxes, fill your boots, and then they can graduate or get on the on-ramp and, and get into your world. I'm so with you. I couldn't be more with you. I, I feel like we've got quite a few generations in this country that were not taught to cook. Yeah. And if recipe boxes are teaching people how to cook, if they're reducing the barriers to entry, if they're educating people, if they're getting them to try new stuff, then I'm all for them. Just in compostable packaging. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll feed that back <laughs> to my friend Anna, who <laughs> works at Gusto. How do you turn this into a campaign? Because just to finish up, just tell us, a, because it's a funny story about you with Jamie in the US doing the school dinner thing. And B, knowing what you've seen Jamie do this firsthand, you were part of it yourself. How do you, we, us, turn this, you know, your amazing recipe book and your amazing philosophy, how do we get it sort of more mass market and campaignable? So the America thing was very funny. I went over to America twice with Jamie to help him, first of all, kind of shift the school dinner system there, which was biggest amount of red tape and bureaucracy I've ever seen in my life. Such pressure from some very, very powerful lobbies. So making any changes there was really, really difficult. And we saw these four British people swanned into an American town and Jamie started telling them how to eat and it was not that it well received. It didn't go down well, did it? Uh, I, I, yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go down well. And I actually remember in a couple of shops, there was a point at which... It didn't feel hostile, I didn't feel threatened, but I remember slightly dumbing down my English accent. You, because you, I, I think you more than dumbed it down. You, didn't you pretend to be <laughs> something else? <laughs> you tried yeah. to pretend you were a local, exactly. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I tried to pretend I was local because it was, 
Jamie goes over with the best intentions and the best will in the world. But, you know, in hindsight, was it the best decision to go to the fattest town in America and reteach them how to eat? It probably was a good town, but comparing the compare and contrast is never yeah, useful, is it? It's extreme. never useful it's too, to tell it's people. I mean, it makes for good telly, but it's, that they're bad um, um, or they're not doing well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, anyway, the America thing. <laughs> Well, good on you for it was trying. quite a ride. Yeah. How do we sort of learn from that and, and help your message of one become more, you know, more of the masses? Yeah, well, that's something I think about a lot um, because I know in some senses my books, you know, my writing, especially in The Guardian, goes into an echo chamber. And so for me, I think the shift of some of my work in the next few years is definitely going to be with children because I feel like that's, well, obviously it's the future, but there's... Over the last year, I've had a lot of thinking time about how I can shift and use what I've learnt to sort of change and educate. So I'm going to be working with a few different organisations um, who are already doing amazing stuff with children. And for me, I feel like that feels the way to shift things. Obviously, I'll carry on doing what I do and writing what I write and sort of, you know, being the biggest vegetable cheerleader <laughs> How tragic does that sound? It's a great um, role. You wear it well. Just, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm working with a brilliant organisation called Taste Ed, which is going into primary schools um, that's spearheaded by the brilliant B. Wilson, who's got the biggest brain that I've ever come across. And it's all about, you know, introducing children to food, fruit and vegetables through their senses. I'm working with a, a lovely project called Grow, which is based at a sort of North London Academy, all about sort of getting kids into growing and the kind of 360 of eating and how it comes from the earth. And then there's another couple of organisations I'm going to work with as well, because I thought of starting something myself, but actually there's so many brilliant people out there already doing work. Back to doing one thing well, right? You, what, what you do well yeah. is the books that let other people who are really good at doing their bit well join forces mm. and there are fantastic I mean you mentioned some there there are some fantastic organizations who when they were teamed up mm. with you could do beautiful things yeah so I think that's the focus I've never really spent much time thinking about kids and how apart from obviously with Jamie but in the last 10 years my focus has been much more on kind of you know family cooking definitely but not specifically on kids so I think that's the answer, isn't it's, it? It's the only, it can be the only answer because we're carrying a lot of blame for all this mess we've created. And I, you know, I have awkward conversations with my kids now about how come you've managed to ruin the planet, Dad, you, you and your mates. And actually, you kind of go, look, yes, I'll take that one on the chin. One gift we can help you with is learning how to eat and how to cook and how to appreciate vegetables and how to cut that whole piece out of our lives. So yeah, and no, I think I think it's got to start with the kids. And I think you know, kids. They don't have the cynicism. They don't have the baggage. They can learn. Well, be it, if someone could tell me how to get my three-year-old to eat vegetables, I will. I will. What is it with three-year-olds <laughs> and vegetables? Anyway. I, I don't know. You know what? I've got a very selective eater in my house too, and everyone's always surprised. They're like, what? I thought he had spirulina for breakfast. I'm like, no, he no, doesn't. No, it's toast, plain toast with butter. <laughs> and I've really enjoyed talking to you, and I'm sure our... Do lectures listeners will love both your story, your message, and, and and your books. So really appreciate your time. Best of luck with one. I think it's amazing. And I'm sure we'll we'll get you back to, to do another dot 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 to pick up the story in the future. But Anna, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm a huge fan of the podcast and do and everything you guys do. So it's a joy. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I think Anna is amazing. I love her book, One Pot Pan Planet. Definitely go and buy it. Do yourself a favour. It's good for you. It's good for your taste buds and it's good for the planet. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you enjoyed today's episode. So please do leave us a review. Please subscribe. And please do send me some feedback at gav at thedolectures.co.uk. Tune in in a couple of weeks when we also have a fantastic guest with an amazing story to tell. In the meantime... This show was produced by George McDonough. The music was by James Morton. Please take care. Stay safe. Thanks. Bye. Bye.